Step 1. This is the Journey to Cloud, 10 Steps in a Single Podcast with Nutanix CIO Wendy Pfeiffer. When I started at Nutanix, we were running many of our core applications and systems on our operating system, which is called AOS. At the time, we were also VMware's sixth largest license holder in Silicon Valley. And my first week on the job, I was presented with VMware's true-up bill for our environments. And it was a multi-million dollar true-up bill. And I remember going home and saying to my husband, I think I'm going to be fired. When I started out three and a half years ago, Nutanix already had apps running in public clouds, along with some very large scale on-premise cloud environments. And those on-premise environments were running on our hyper-converged infrastructure, but only just barely. On our journey from private cloud to hybrid cloud, we needed to undertake some key steps to get us from the standard mode of IT operation to an enhanced mode of IT operation known as hybrid cloud operation. I'm working at a company that has a free hypervisor, and yet I've just been presented with a multi-million dollar hypervisor bill from VMware. So something's wrong. Why are we not using our own hypervisor? What I discovered is it was for the most basic of and sort of innocent of reasons. It was because we never really had time. We never really had impetus to move the environments from ESXi to our hypervisor, AHV. Once I understood what was at stake in terms of the company's money, we began the migration process. And we worked with the engineering team to uh, define our need for data movement. And we spent, I I had planned out a a long timeline with, you know, extensive change management and so on. But we spent about four months to move all of our environments off of VMware's ESXi and onto Nutanix AHV. And At a minimum, we saved millions and millions of dollars in licensing fees. But what we also created was a common substrate, a common foundation on to which we now operate. Step two, this is the idea. Everywhere I run, I run a common foundation. If IT is going to make our companies productive, if we're going to make our employees productive, then our services need to be as easy to use as our smartphones, as easy to use as the consumer technologies that are all around us in our work environments today. I run a foundation of our operating system, AOS, and I run our hypervisor, AHV. And that operating system and that hypervisor First of all, they can run on any vendor's hardware. In my data centers, I have a mix of HPE, Lenovo, Dell, IBM Power. I have a mix of hardware. In the old days, pre-Nutanix, when I purchased, for example, Lenovo hardware, I would choose the operating system that I would run on that hardware, and then I would be locked in to that hardware and I would be locked into that operating system for any applications that I wanted to run. And hardware vendors also had very draconian licensing practices and purchasing practices. So, you know, as an IT organization, I'd have to declare, well, I'm I'm a Lenovo shop or I'm a Dell shop. And then when I needed more capacity, in order to make that, that, those additional servers work with my existing servers, my existing hardware, I'd have to buy the same kind 
So if I had mostly Dell in my environment and I needed to expand, I would have to buy more Dell for the, all of those devices to work together well. Nutanix operating system obviates the underlying hardware layer. Today, if I'm getting favorable pricing from Dell, I can purchase more Dell when I need to scale. But if next week I'm getting more favorable pricing from HPE, then I can add HPE to my environments with no penalty. Our operating system makes all of that different hardware work together well in the same way. Likewise, I operate in public cloud. And in public cloud, if you operate an application in Amazon, for example, in AWS, it is almost impossible to run that same application in the same way, the same code in Google and GCP because of these underlying differences. But when I run the things that I run on the combination of AOS and AHV, that flexible foundation, now I can essentially run that infrastructure anywhere. It's infrastructure that runs anywhere on any hardware and virtually any public cloud. So we use the same software and the same code, if you will, to call that infrastructure anywhere. It's sort of like write once and reuse many, many times. So it's an incredibly efficient mode of operation. I have this very flexible foundation. If you could operate in any model, whether it's all on premise or all in public cloud and so on, what would be the ideal? Hybrid cloud. Step three. If I have purpose built something for public cloud, I cannot physically walk up to a server and restart it or add a hard drive or install software directly on that server. Everything I do has to be done remotely and has to be done via software. And then there's this notion in public cloud that there is unlimited resource. I don't have to go install five more servers in the rack next to the current rack in order to get access to resources. I can just ask for additional capacity via software and that capacity will magically quickly be available to me. Our operating system and our hypervisor were not developed in order to sell more of a particular vendor's hardware or to cause people to consume more of a particular vendor's public cloud. We are the only operating system and hypervisor that were purpose-built to create a hybrid cloud everywhere across all of those substrates. We're truly unique in that way. And so this puts tremendous power in the hands of IT. What this allows me to do is to create infrastructure that runs the same way, whether it's physical infrastructure on premise in one of my many data centers, or whether it's cloud infrastructure in someone's public cloud. Ultimately, as well, I get huge efficiencies of scale or huge economies of scale in my people. So I run my servers the same way, whether I run them on Dell or HP or Lenovo hardware, or whether I run them in AWS or GCP. My automation works in all of those environments. My applications work in all of those environments. And my storage engineers and network engineers operate the same way in all of those environments. That's an absolute game changer. And so I went from having specialized people for all of these different modes and environments and hardware and infrastructure to having a team of people who are specialized in running hybrid cloud. And quite literally, I have six human beings who run all of the infrastructure across six data centers 
large-scale global data centers and delivering services to 125 Nutanix locations. AOS and AHV, unlike the last, last decade's products, they were purpose-built for scale-out cloud. This operating system was purpose-built with the notion that I may never be able to be hands-on with hardware. I may be running some of these workloads on-premise, but I may be running some of these workloads in public cloud. So I need to run the workload the same way, whether I'm running it on-premise or in public cloud, which means everything about accessing system resources and assigning system resources has to be done via code, has to be done via software. However, it's operating inside of a rich IT ecosystem. And so because of that, it has to be very dynamic and accessible to IT folks who might want to have very granular controls over how they manage their use of infrastructure. So the operating system was built in advance with the notion that we may never be able to be hands-on with these resources, and we may have very unpredictable scale and unpredictable requirements. All of those things have to be handled at an operating system level, and as many of those things as possible should be available both autonomously and with the kinds of granular controls that IT requires. This is truly the first operating system that was built on purpose with that in mind. Now we're on to step four of our journey, the user experience. In our data centers and in our environments, we're sort of like Noah's Ark. I have at least two of every app you can imagine and every network device you can imagine and every service you can imagine running somewhere in one of my environments, running that overall giant mixed on-premise and SaaS set of applications and services across mixed hardware and multiple global data centers and public clouds, it could be massively confusing and dysfunctional to the people who have to access that. The first thing we had to do was learn about our users. Who are they? Can they be classified into groups? Do they have unique requirements? Are they accessing systems in a particular way? Ultimately, when we get infrastructure out of the way, when we begin to be able to call infrastructure as code, and we begin to be able to use the same team and the same software processes and the same automation to run our workloads in any mode, this gives me the capability to look at the capacity that this frees up in my team Now we're focused on our mission. At Nutanix, we have some big blocks of specialized users. One block of specialized users is our salespeople, and one block of specialized users is our engineers. They had very, very different requirements and modes of operation. So one of the things that happened is we needed to enable secure access to our environments, especially our build and develop environments for our software developers. And so for those folks, it is very, very resource intensive, compute and storage intensive to develop and test operating system code. And that's our company's intellectual property. So we needed to create environments that were absolutely secure and that could be securely accessed from anywhere in the world. What we did is we worked with the folks at Citrix to certify Citrix VDI to run performantly and securely and well on our Nutanix operating system and hypervisor. 
And then we created these secure environments in our own data centers for our engineers to connect to and to operate and run and do their jobs. And so we have literally thousands of engineers connecting securely over Citrix and AOS and AHV into our core data centers and environments and running their code. And that's the way they prefer to operate. Our salespeople, on the other hand, they are mostly remote. They're visiting their uh, customer and prospect environments. They are in, you know, most major cities around the world. They're not necessarily connected directly to our engineering hubs. Of course, in these times of global pandemic, everyone's remote. Salespeople also need to interact with our CRM systems and with product information and demo environments and so on. But that interaction needs to take place over public internet. And so for those folks, we use a Nutanix VDI technology called Frame. This is a new kind of VDI that operates performantly over public internet, that offers security, that offers flexibility. And it took us less than a day to enable this environment for thousands of our remote workers. And what Frame allows them to do is it allows us to create persistent user profiles for them so that when they log in, we know who they are and we give them access to their data and their tools and the things that they need to do their jobs all over public internet. So we have one shared private cloud And that shared private cloud can be accessed in different ways and in different modes by our different groups of users. Providing that access would actually have involved building out new and separate environments with any other vendor's technology. So our next step was to figure out how could we do more of our common functions in IT autonomously. Step five, if you've ever knitted, you cause your body and your mind to converge on thousands of times in a row, doing the same stitch again and again and again and again. People like me can't even make it through one line on the knitted item without like having to undo stitches. I I don't have that ability to be that consistent. Most human beings don't. So what the machine does, it just follows the instructions and it can follow the instructions infinitely as long as you have electricity power in it. So now we've got thousands of folks interacting with our on-premise and public cloud environments, our homegrown applications and tools and our SaaS applications and tools. And they're doing all of this off of this common substrate, this hybrid cloud that we built. We became more productive. We started doing more things. And as we did more things, our volumes increased. The company itself was growing along my journey as well. As we were trying to support all of this complexity, we were spending 6 to 7% of our annual operating budget on IT. That's a little on the high side, even for technology companies. The standard is more like 4% of the company spend. How do we keep up with this? Automation held a real key for us. One of the things that we did is we took a look at how we handled our networking. At that time, our networking was a very, very hands-on process. We worked with a third-party vendor who certified their networking product to run on AOS and AHV. And we went from having Cisco in our core to having this third-party vendor's software-defined network at our core. We started doing all of our core routing and switching via a software-defined network. This means that I no longer need to have people who are physically configuring top-of-rack switches in my data centers. I don't need to rewrite my operating code to run in public cloud versus on-premise. I handle networking the exact same way, whether that networking is happening in any of my global on-premise data centers or is happening in public cloud. 
And so that then frees us up to begin to automate how we run. Recall that I said I have a few thousand salespeople, but I also have a few thousand engineers. And those engineers rely on me to provide them access to their development environments and their test environments and so on. Because those environments are accessible via code, I can directly provide self-service via automation to those engineers. So instead of those engineers having to ask mother may I every time they want access to a new VM or a new environment, they can access and call those environments themselves using pre-built automation that we make available to them. In addition, I now have a staff of IT professionals who have deep expertise in modes of IT operation, whether these are CCIEs who know how to manage networks or storage experts or systems experts, those folks are now able to translate their expertise in how things operate into code, which can be invoked and called and used to operate. And so what this allowed us to do is to offer all of the rich complexity of our multiple environments and tools and modes of operation to offer that via an input mechanism that was repeatable, that was near autonomous. Although Nutanix has been growing 47% year over year, my IT team has only grown 21% in total in the last three years, meaning that we are serving more and more people, but we're doing that uh, with less and less relative resource as we begin to automate. Today, I have 69 IT professionals who support 7,500 workers. That's a ratio of one IT person to every 683. And the industry average is more like one to 72. So that's huge. Today, instead of being six to 7% of the company's operating budget, with this huge year over year growth in Nutanix, our spending today is now 1.9% as a percentage of our budget. Next, step six. There's a lot of magic. Uh, there's a lot of coolness around machine learning, natural language processing. And um, when we think about machine learning, the value of machine learning is that machines are infinitely consistent. There's no like super rocket science or intelligence in that, but that's the point. There's no need for human intelligence. Ultimately, I thought maybe this is a bridge too far, right? I have traditional IT folks. But what I discovered is uh, the set of low-code and no-code tools that enable people who have expertise in IT infrastructure and IT operational processes essentially to write code, to automate those things. Once I began to enable my team members to use these low-code and no-code tools to translate their expertise into code. Well, then we had the baseline automations that we could use to run, you know, at least some of our environments. But the code that someone who is a deep storage engineer or a deep network engineer writes, it might not be as efficient and as beautiful, if you will, as code that a software developer writes. This is where machine learning comes into the picture. We can take machine learning tools and train them. We can point them at the, the code that was created by these low-code and no-code tools. We can start by taking the expertise of our IT team members, their expertise and their productive way of operating technology. We can translate that into simple code that explains how they operate and the optimal modes in which they operate in a machine-readable way. And then we can take machine learning tools and technologies and point those tools and technologies at the code and at our operational data and train those tools and those technologies so that ultimately what we have 
is a infrastructure as code operating model that has been refined through machine learning tools and technologies and that operates optimally. As we have begun to do that, the first thing that happened is that we have increased our overall velocity for all the work that we do in IT by over 30%. So as we start to replace some of our tasks with machine learning code and technology, we're reducing context switching for our people, and we are also reducing the complexity of doing our work. And so that helps people to be more productive. But secondly, we are also beginning to handle more and more tasks autonomously, and that's pretty cool. Now we're at step seven. There were no instructions. Right away, you could figure out how to start catching Pokemon. It was instantly compelling. It was fun. It was, dare I say, delightful. Let's say the next time that we interacted with our corporate enterprise environments and our corporate enterprise apps, if those enterprise applications were as accessible and as easy to use and as compelling as, say, Pokemon Go, what an amazing level of productivity we'd have in our companies. Once we start to do these autonomous things, the potential is that the work that we're doing and the service that we're providing becomes sort of two-dimensional for our users. Um, If you think about the way that you interact with Siri or the way that you interact with Google Assistant, sometimes those interactions kind of fall flat. We had a lot of focus on finding tools and technologies, including natural language processing tools and technologies that matched the ideal interaction design and the ideal workflows that these different groups of users required and and wanted. We used a couple of tools to measure our baseline operating model. We used a quantitative tool called FTR, it means first time right. And we use that to measure the optimal workflows and interaction designs that we were delivering to our users. And then we used net promoter score to gauge sort of how people felt about what we were delivering to them. In the beginning, oh my goodness, um, we had very, very poor FTR scores and very, very poor NPS scores when we were operating in standard IT mode. But as we've undertaken this journey to autonomous operations and machine learning and natural language processing enhanced operations across about 35% of the things that we're doing, what we've discovered is that our FTR score has increased tremendously, but way more impactful, our NPS score is among the highest IT NPS scores in the industry. Today, we often operate at an NPS of around 90, which is just enviable. There's almost no one else at that level in industry. And so it's a real, uh, real advantage for us. Now, ultimately, I have a very small team that supports a multi-cloud infrastructure with multiple workloads, multiple applications, that can run interchangeably across lots of different hardware, several different clouds. But because I have this foundation of a single code set that spans all of those things, and I can call that code via very simple automation that my expert team members have developed, and we can refine the way that we operate through machine learning and natural language processing tools and technologies, we have this very efficient mode of operation that is also highly satisfying to our employees. And ultimately, what does that that translate to? 
Well, what that translates to, you know, when you have happy employees, those are productive employees. And so we're back to IT's original charter. Our charter is to enable our business to thrive and to enable our employees to be productive. And so when we get to the point where our IT team members are, have stopped focusing on all of the different vendors and modes of operation and keeping the lights on and maintaining all of these diverse environments, and instead we focus on enabling our employees to be productive, to be, dare I say, happy in the way that they're working. And we can provide that optionality efficiently with a relatively small team in ways that are cost effective to the company. Well, then we're starting to truly operate in this mixed mode, this hybrid cloud mode. Because it's not about multi things, it's about hybrid things. It's about this optionality of operating on any hardware, in any cloud, any application or combination of applications via multiple access methods and being able to do all of this as autonomously as possible so that we can scale efficiently. Step eight, getting dressed in the morning. The optimal workflow for getting dressed in the morning is first your underwear, then your pants, then your socks, then your shoes. There's an optimal interaction design related to getting dressed in the morning. You wouldn't want to get dressed in a snowbank or on the bus on the way to work. And when it got to the time where you needed to put your socks on, you'd like to have a chair nearby that you could sit down on in order to get your socks on and then your shoes on. If we translate that to things we do in IT, there is an optimal workflow for everything we do in IT, the most efficient and effective way of doing the work. FTR is a measurement of how well we are doing at delivering our services. There's an optimal way of interacting with the people and the technologies and the tools that we need to deliver that service. And so we start by defining that. And then we measure every time we deliver that service, how well we did against that FTR description. So Usually, if you do every single step, both in the workflow and the interaction design accurately and perfectly, you score a one. And if you get any little part of that wrong, you know, put your underwear on last, for example, then you score a zero. You're not doing it right the first time. We defined our FTR for everything we did in IT, starting with the most impactful and the largest volume things. And then we measured how we were doing. Same thing with the qualitative measurement, NPS, Net Promoter Score. This is a scoring that many companies use today, and Nutanix actually uses this uh, method with our customers to understand not just how well are we delivering stuff to them, but how does that make them feel? And in IT, it's not as normal to measure net promoter score with employees, but in fact, we believe that employee happiness is a big part of employee productivity. And so we started measuring that as well. And what we discovered is we had a number of services that even though we thought we were being efficient with them, we were not delivering them optimally in line with our FTR descriptions. And even when we were delivering things well, uh, sometimes people kind of wished us dead for the way in which we were interacting with them, right? People were not happy. And so we also discovered this other truth with, which IT departments understand, but uh, it's, it's kind of hard for us sometimes to get this, which is oftentimes doing something precisely, perfectly, correctly doesn't necessarily result in a good outcome. 
And so many times we would do things that would check all of our boxes, but the resulting delivery was very difficult to interact with. I don't even know that the NPS scale had negative numbers on it, but NPS scales go to negative 140. And we actually hit that number a few times as we started to measure our delivery. Very, very painful. We had some key services that we delivered where our overall scoring, our overall FTR scoring was zero, meaning we never delivered that service correctly the first time. The good news about these things is things that are difficult to deliver and things that are hard to interact around are wonderful candidates for machine learning and natural language processing. Things that people find complex, the machine finds straightforward. And so our measured FTR went from zero to 100%. The machine does the process exactly correctly every time. But way more importantly than that, of course, that's the power of automation, but way more importantly than that is our NPS went into the high 90s from the high negative 100s to the high 90s. Huge, huge swing in satisfaction. Also what happened though is overall, as we began to offload some of these problem activities and services to modern technologies, the result was that the human work that we did began to get better as well. We noticed that the non-autonomous things that we did experienced a 30% acceleration in the speed at which we delivered those things. As we reduced rework, and as we reduced context switching, user satisfaction improved, delivery across the board for all of the services, even the non-autonomous services improved, and ultimately we got more capacity out of our team. So what did we do? We went to the next worst thing and we applied this same process to that and then the next worst thing, and applied the same process to that. More than 40% of everything that we do in IT to support our company is now handled autonomously. Even better than that, other departments in the company have seen this process that we've gone through, and now sales operations, HR, legal facilities, and other teams, including engineering operations, have adopted these same metrics and these same measurements and the same process, and they're starting to reap the benefits as well. This isn't just an IT thing, but it was only an IT thing that we could undertake because we had freed up our capacity from dealing with this endless KTLO, keep the lights on work, and we had this common hybrid cloud that we were already managing well, so now we could start to focus on that next layer. We're continuing that journey even though we're all working remotely now. This is step nine. I mean, this is massive ROI and long-term savings as well. One of my architects came to me and said, you know, since we're doing all of this infrastructure as code stuff, couldn't we have a software-defined network? Couldn't we run a completely software-defined network and treat our networking as code? And although it was a little bit scary at the time that we deployed this, we were the world's largest software-defined network, commercial network. We did that. We took all of the traditional physical routing and switching out of our environments. And today we run a big switch software-defined network on commodity hardware running on AOS and AHV. Now, what does that do for us? Well, the first thing that it does for us is it provides us with the kind of scale out capacity that in our networks we get with our systems, that sort of virtualization layer. Secondly, the cost of the hardware is reduced extensively. I reduced my planned CapEx spend by 90% just to buy this model of using commodity hardware. 
Thirdly, we're able to treat our entire environment as a virtual private cloud, whether that environment is running in public cloud or on premise in one of any of our data centers. And so this gives us flexibility, optionality, scaling, et cetera. And in these times of 100% remote work, we've been able to flexibly adjust our networks even as we've turned the network inside out. Even more importantly to the financial folks, and uh, you know, this was unexpected for me. I'd love to say this was my plan. This actually wasn't my plan. My plan was to move one data center at a time. But when we realized our cost savings, our CFO asked us to move all of them at once. And so we did over the course of 17 weeks, we shuttered four large scale data centers and spun up three new large scale data centers. And in the same year as the project, we realized 200% return on investment, not over five years, but in the same year of the project, we got back over 200% of our project costs just in moving to this software defined, modern, everything running on AOS and AHV mode. In addition to that, we now manage these environments remotely because all of the infrastructure can be addressed as code. And we have that same small team who now are managing those network elements as well. We saved a lot of money in CapEx and so on. But another great thing is we began to be able to work the whole body of hardware. So we are able to use all of our hardware resources in these data centers for whatever part of our workloads need extra capacity. And we're able to dynamically assign that capacity, whether we need additional storage, additional compute, more network capacity, et cetera. And so this very efficient use of hardware and systems and capacity has been part of what has saved us about 50% over our previous power consumption. And to be clear, we didn't spin up new hardware. We physically moved hardware over 17 weekends. We loaded up trucks and drove them to the new data centers and put them in place. And so this power savings is not about having fancy new low power consumption hardware. This power the savings is around more efficiently using the hardware that we have using hyper-converged infrastructure. This isn't really an IT discussion. It's just a human discussion. The only way that we progress is from a position of humility, a position of honesty, and then we have to have a desire to progress. We have to have a hunger to do the work. And so if people inside of a company have that hunger, then that company will progress. If an IT department has that hunger and that humility and that desire to progress, then we don't have to do gigantic things. Every small thing we do makes a difference. That has led us to what I'm going to call step 10. We now have this common substrate, which is helping us to operate a virtual private cloud effectively across on-premise and public cloud environments. We have this common AOS and AHV making everything that we run, run efficiently and make the most efficient use of resources. Also, our people are running a single shared technical and operational environment. On top of that, we are measuring how effectively and efficiently we deliver services, both business services and capabilities to our company, as well as services to our employees. And as we measure any opportunities for improvement, we're applying modern technologies and tools to address those challenges. And so we are doing more and more things right the first time as we continuously improve. 
and our NPS scores are remaining at 90 or above, meaning our employees are continuously being presented with very productive ways of working. The next thing that we're doing, I'm the living example of that right now, we're starting to share this with our peers outside of Nutanix. This has been such a transformational and powerful journey for Nutanix. And we're also learning from how other folks use our technologies. We are constantly tuning that engine. We're constantly fueling ourselves and our team members with new opportunities to improve. Over time, but especially over the next, let's call it six to 12 months, as the world is figuring out how to move ahead in this time of hybrid cloud, hybrid work, hybrid modes of everything, education, uh, doing business, communication, et cetera. Look, we're having to do everything well all at once. At the same time, there's so much pressure on us economically, and we have much less ability to actually send people in to do hands-on work. So we have to do much more virtually and remotely and so on. We don't want the easy button, but we want the healthy button. We want the button that allows us to keep that very diverse, complex ecosystem healthy through every season through every time of change. And we want every member of that ecosystem to thrive, whether it's sales or R&D or finance or legal or even IT folks themselves. And no matter in what geography, no matter in what area of the world, no matter in what vertical, we need to have this capability to run and manage our ecosystems well. And the ideal model for doing that is hybrid cloud, and the only way to truly run a hybrid cloud is to have a common operating system and hypervisor and set of tools. At this point, the only vendor I know of who offers that is Nutanix. Yes, I work for Nutanix, but it's technically correct that we're the only ones who have this capability at this time. And so it's just been a pleasurable journey for me at Nutanix. And I'm hoping that this journey and talking about how we got from where we started to this point today will be helpful to others as they're working through this time. Wendy Pfeiffer is the CIO of Nutanix. The 10 episodes of Journey to Cloud in this single podcast wasn't easy to edit because there were so many great stories and comments Wendy gave us. It was hard to choose what made it in the final mix. This is the Tech Barometer Podcast. I'm Jason Lopez. Tech Barometer is a production of The Forecast. You can find more stories about technology and the people in tech at theforecastbynutanix.com.